Hi, welcome everybody. Warburton's Baker's Born and Bread. Just one cornetto. In Britain, there are some food and drinks brands we love so much Ooh. that they feel like they're part of the family. In all truth, who eats the most of these in our house? You. Yes. You! <laughs> I'm Helen Skelton. Oh, my word! And I'm going behind closed doors... Beans, beans, hines. ...to discover the secrets... <laughs> ..of some of the world's biggest super brands. Without the yeast, there is no Guinness. So are we going to see a load more Cocoa Pops flavours then? We'd have to kill you if we told you that. <laughs> I want to find out how they make the things we love... Are you ever going to find the perfect potato? Maybe not, but doesn't mean you shouldn't try. How they build their global empires. Tell me how you get to be... How do I get to be the big cheese? Yes. What have Walker's done right? You know, they get the right people to do their adverts for them. <laughs> <laughs> and what gives them sleepless nights? We have got to try and rescue that brand from where it is now and make it into what it should be. You're at your most vulnerable when you're at your most successful. Have you seen how much the dog's panting for your sandwich? Mummy, put it on my plate. I haven't got another plate. As a mum of three kids, bread is always an essential item on my shopping list. Kiss for me, kiss for me. <laughs> Thanks, Mummy. I think the fascinating thing about bread is that lots of us eat it every single day and it's such a massive part of the staple shop. What are you getting? Bread and milk. What's in your cupboard? Bread. It's kind of always there. In Britain, we produce nearly six million loaves a day. But there's one company that has fought off all the competition to become the nation's best-selling bakery brand. Warburton's makes 25% of all the bread sold in Britain. They've built their business on the iconic white sliced loaf. But for many, they're also the brand of choice for tea cakes, bagels, pitters, thins, crumpets and pancakes. The list goes on. I'll start with the kids. Their favourite is the white toasty. They can get through a loaf of this in one sitting. Honestly, they're like locusts. Mmm, delicious. I prefer a good old farmhouse. Mmm, I can't buy anything else but Warburton's bread. Warburton's produces over 70 different products, delivering to 15,000 shops a day. And despite being a national bakery for just 15 years, they've beaten some of the most famous brands at their own game. It's as good for you today as it's always been. Whatever you think about Warburton's, they are so big in terms of profit. No one's bigger than them in this country other than Coca-Cola, and that's a drinks manufacturer. And I don't understand how Warburton's, a family business from Bolton, has the dominance that it does. Simply split them, toast them, butter them up and add your favourite filling and enjoy Warburton's rather special toasting muffins. This baking giant started out from humble beginnings. In 1876, Thomas and Ellen Warburton baked their first batch of white loaves in their small Bolton grocery store. They sold out in under an hour. The company opened its first bakery in 1915. It was hailed as a modern bakery using state-of-the-art machinery. Today, the company's HQ stands next to the site of Thomas and Ellen's original shop. And 146 years later, it has evolved into a bread-making empire. Hello. Oh, you can smell bread. Oh, my word. I shouldn't be surprised by that. It is the epicentre of the biggest baking empire in Britain. Inside this Space Age bakery, they make nine different Warburton's products. On the assembly line today are armies of their classic white toasty loaf. And also their best-selling crumpets. The whole operation is based on Warburton's guiding principle that their bread should be as fresh as possible when it reaches the customer. 
technical manager Joanna is going to show me how they achieve this. Oh, sanitise as well. OK, so where do we begin? This is just the mixing area, so we mix and shape the dough. And that's before it goes um, for proving and into the oven, cooling and wrapping. All of the ingredients are delivered in bulk into the mixers. Right. We use 600 tonnes in total of flour a week, so the scale of it's quite large. 600 tonnes of flour a week? Yes. And how many loaves of bread are you making a week? Uh, it can range around 1.3 to 1.6 million loaves a week from this bread plant. The flour is mixed together with yeast, water, salt and vegetable oil. Four minutes later, a quarter of a tonne of dough is produced. It's then cut into loaf-sized portions. Shall we go have a feel of some? Yes! So right now we're making our 800 gram Warburton's toasting. It's an iconic product for Warburton. The toasty loaf first appeared in the mid-1980s and is still sold in its distinctive wax paper wrapper. It has become the company's best-seller. Can we touch one of these? Absolutely, pick it up. It's really sticky, isn't it, and yeah. strong. Yeah, so what we're looking for here is a nice, soft, flexible dough piece. 90% of the quality of a bread product is made at the mixing stage. So the softness and flexibility, and then that enables the dough piece to be coiled and then pieced before it goes into the tin for proving and baking. That's hurting my biceps, going like that. That's... We're overworking the dough, so we wouldn't want something like that going through the plant now, so we best put this one not back on here. <laughs> we'll pop it in the uh, waste kit. Your face then when I went, no. <laughs> then we go into the interprover for three minutes. So it's just relaxing the dough piece before we then shape it. OK, so where does it go from here? We go round the corner. So this is where we shape our bread. We check for the pan in to make sure that they're in the tin centrally. Then it goes into the prover. Wow. All the way down to the other side and then back again. Oh, that smell is so good, isn't it? Yeah. Do you, you ever get sick of that? Much. No. Can no. you bottle that, please? I'm just, like, <laughs> so happy now. The loaves are left to rise on moving shelves before conveyor belts transport them to be baked in an oven the size of eight double-decker buses. All of the products here that we've been making today, they are coming out of the oven now. Every loaf that we produce, the height is measured of every single one. It's scanned and we even have a LED screen there that, that tells us that we're in spec. The figure there is an average of 25 loaves of bread. And if it falls below or above, what happens? Is that panic stations? If that ever goes to red, we take action. But, but anything that we can find to improve, we do it. We improve. Can we move away from the oven? Yes, we can. <laughs> Woo! How long does it take to make a complete loaf? From when the ingredients is being put into the mixer to when the product's cooled and to when the product's light and packed, it takes four hours from start to finish. How many hours a week does it operate? 24, seven. And yeah. days? Uh, 364 days a year. So we close for Christmas day. Freshness is, is, is such a key priority for the business. Right. So we want to make it and get it out into store as fast as possible. Make today, sell tomorrow. The job of getting the bread from the bakery floor to the supermarket shelves falls to Lee the driver operations manager. Hello, you must be Lee. I am, yes. So this is your domain? It is, yes, certainly is. So what happens in here? So this is what we call the dispatching area. Over the average week, we've probably dispatched between 1.5 and 1.8 million units. So if you think how fresh that is, our aim is to get it to the customer or the consumer in the shortest possible time. But how quickly will it be on the way to a Tesco or Morrison's or whatever? It can be anything from a maximum of 15 hours, and I've had experiences where it's been on, in the customer's uh, premises within 15, 20 minutes of being baked. So that's shorter time scale. God, that's crazy, isn't it? Mm. It is full on and it is non stop. So, how far and wide are these products going? Uh, to the tip of North Scotland, down to the Isle of Wight, and uh, we even have some exports as well. How many years have you been here now? Lee? 35. 35. Same department. I think I'll stay. <laughs> it's easy to forget that this bread-making giant is still run by a family 
Many companies that start out this way eventually get bought out. Why haven't these guys, how are they still making it work? How are they still running it as a family business? It's rare and it's intriguing. Warburton's is now Britain's number one bakery brand. Hello! Hi Helen, how are you? Lovely to meet you. Jonathan's ready for you. Would you like to step upstairs? Yes, please. Okay. This family business is currently run by the fifth generation of the Warburton family. Cousins Jonathan, Brett and Ross. As chairman, Jonathan is the public face of the company. Oh yeah, come in, don't worry, I'm just responding. Hi, Helen. He is. Hi, I'm the Jonathan. The man, the myth, the legend. How are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, lovely to meet you. I recognise you from the telly. <laughs> tell me then, tell me how you get to be... How do I get to be the big cheese? Yes. Well, obviously... Well, it helps shows. being called Warburton, for yeah. a start. I mean, how big is the business? I could rattle some stats off you. So the turnover's approximately 550 million. A year? Yeah, yeah. And this is a number that always staggers me. We make... 800 million products with our name on it every year in the UK. See? Does that scare you? Does it scare me? No. Never think about it. If I'd have heard myself saying that 20 years ago, I'd have thought you were a gun bugger. When Jonathan joined the family firm in 1980, they were a small but ambitious regional bakery in the northwest. Warburton's when I joined the business had just started doing business with the major supermarkets in a tiny amount. But we had nobody in the business who had any experience to deal with, with bigger customers. This was Jonathan's chance to prove himself and the beginning of Warburton's plans to expand. You know, when, when we came in, it was a very local band. Uh, it was very northwest. I mean, we used to do a bit of TV advertising, which was Granada TV. Why are girls always mum? Because mums are girls. Big girls. Why is this bread round? It's a black corn milk roll. Why milk? Well, it's differenter. <laughs> Another rather special loaf from Warburton's. By the late 1980s, Warburton's had ramped up their development plans and the family appointed Jonathan as marketing director. His first challenge was to find a way of making Warburton's a household name outside the Northwest. So when the ad agency said, you know, your, your wheat store is the dullest thing I've ever heard, <laughs> the only thing that's interesting about you lot is you're still a family business. We'd really like to use the family. I then went to my parents, who, bless them, said, well, we'll only do it as long as we're part of the fun of it. This is Mrs Joyce Warburton, a member of the Warburton baking family. For five generations, the Warburtons have taken the finest ingredients, added their own baking skills, and produced bread as only they know how. Of course, Mrs. Warburton, nay Booth, is only a member of the family by marriage. So she has to rely on her husband, Derek. Warburtons, bakers born and bred. It has such a warm yeah. feeling, it works, doesn't it? Was it hard to get your mum and dad to do it? Um, she was a very good singer, my mum. And um, I think she sort of thought it was finally it was the opportunity she was getting the recognition that she deserved. So she probably edged Dad into it and go, look, let's give it a go. But at that point, you weren't advertising nationally. So that was really only shown at the beginning in the Northwest. And then what we did is, as, as we developed the business and went to new areas, we would open in Yorkshire or in the Northeast or down in the Midlands, we'd run that ad. To create the perfect loaf, you need a keen eye, an obsession for quality, meticulous... By the early 1990s, the family's on-screen characters had taken on a life of their own in Warburton's adverts. Derek, do we have to go through this rigmarole every time? Just throw it to the ducks. <laughs> but you've kept family members yourself in the adverts. We have, and uh, I'm suddenly finding myself in the position where my parents were. We changed agency and, and they, look, our strong recommendation is you've got to use the family. By following his parents' footsteps into the limelight, Jonathan Warburton became a household name. So your ego gets carried away, but then the flip side of that is, is that people think, 
well, look at him, he's just showing off. So you've got to temper it and take it for what it is. You've had some <laughs> massive names. Yeah, we have. You know, George Clooney, Robert De Niro, Sylvester Stallone. What did it do for Warburton's having the Hollywood actor of the time? Has it worked? Oh, yeah, I mean, it works at two levels. Do we get people talking about it? Yes. Have we sold more Toasty? Yes. Can you quantify that? What kind yeah. of numbers? Three weeks into the campaign, our volume of Toasty was up sort of 7%. Now, that's on a couple of million. So that's big numbers. Tell me the bit about the bread again. The strategy of having the family star in their ads has created a distinctive brand image. It's helped the company expand over the last 30 years. They now have 11 bakeries and 18 depots, enabling Warburton's to deliver fresh bread to all parts of Britain. Despite being the company chairman, Jonathan's close attention to detail means he can often be seen doing spot checks at supermarkets himself. And I do this regularly. I'll just come in as a punter, wander around, and then the weird bloke's in again, you know, you get the message. The guy doesn't buy anything and walks around rearranging his bread on the <laughs> fixture. What do you do, then, when you say you rearrange? Well, what I would do is I'd be pulling products to the front, <laughs> I'd be making sure that, you know, it's well-branded okay. so you can see it, or, you know, and, and making sure that it, it looks neat and tidy and attractive. But there is a lot in yeah, here, isn't there? Like, obviously, Warburton's is here. Yep. But you're right next to Kingsmill, you're right next to Hovis. Yep. There's a lot of competition out there, isn't there? There is a lot of competition, and, I mean, we would, we would say that it's good. I mean, having competition is, is inevitable. Yeah, well, it is as long as you're beating them. Right. Uh, but it is good. You know, it keeps you sharp, makes you develop new products. Freshness is important to you. Hugely. Getting bread out so quickly, so constantly, so that it's fresh is undoubtedly impressive. But so what this about is the a waste? Very sophisticated. We get very little waste. So all of this, and there's all that fresh bread at the end, and obviously it's a fresh yeah. product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of that's getting sold. Yeah, I will, I'm certainly most of, well, I was for sure, I can't speak for the others, but yeah, most of it's sold on a daily basis. The bread aisles were stacked and packed, and I don't believe for one second that all of the bread we saw is getting eaten today. And if we acknowledge that, like Warblins do, fresh is the key, fresh is what we want, then surely a lot of that is getting chucked away. Because I don't want to go in tomorrow and buy three-day-old bread, no, I don't. I want fresh stuff. Surely there's got to be some left over from today. Surely. In Britain, bread is the second most wasted food product, with around nine billion slices a year discarded from our homes and supermarkets. Hello, you must be Adam. Hi. To find out more, I'm meeting Adam, who runs the Real Junk Food Project in Leeds a not-for-profit organisation that collects unsold food from supermarkets that would otherwise be binned and shares it with local schools and charities. But bread, how much bread's coming in and how regularly? Uh, bread comes in every day. I think you can speak to any third sector project in the country and they will tell you that they simply cannot deal with the amount of bread that they get given to them. So what sort of volume are we talking So anything between 80 kilos and 800 kilos a day we can do. Every simply. single day? Yeah. Why is there so much bread? I think uh, bread is a lost leader. It's cheap to make. In supermarkets can mix lots of it and only sell a certain percentage of it. We've got that nostalgic impact when you go into supermarkets, you can smell the bread in the aisles and it smells fresh. If they fill the shelves up with bread, people tend to think that the other shelves are going to be full as well, so there's that psychological impact. And if anything, it's got worse. So there's more waste bread now than there was in recent years? There's more waste food now than ever before. But they would argue that customers want fresh bread. If you look in comparison to other countries, like if you go to France, for example, um, they make fresh bread every single day and they sell out, and once it's gone, it's gone. You know, they've got that type of culture, whereas in this country, they make bread 24-7, regardless if they sell it or not. So you go 9, 10 o'clock at night and there's fresh bread on the shelves. All of this stuff, is this typical for, what, a day, a week? No, this is one van load. And we've got four vans collecting food between 8 and 10 hours a day. But aren't we the consumer of the problem? Because I don't want a three-day-old loaf of bread, I want a fresh one. 
but you can't blame people for their basic human rights and it's a basic human right to have access to food. It's not the consumer's fault that we have so much waste, it's the industry's fault that they generate and create far too much of it. The Real Junk Food Project is doing a wonderful thing. I'm in awe of Adam's energy, but how do we square the circle? You know, at some point, companies like Warburton have got to wake up and think, we're making too much bread. It seems that the amount of bread supplied to supermarkets is greater than the demand. Megan! So I want to find out if Warburton's has a plan to tackle this. Um, let's talk about the challenge of waste. Yep. How much bread is being wasted on a daily basis? What I do know is that we gave... We, we gave 400,000 loaves last year into Fair Share. Mm -hmm. uh, so product that came back to us that was still within shelf life and, and perfectly edible, we then gave away. What we're not doing is chuck it in a skip. Because the third sector would argue that there's too much bread, they can't give it away. Because if they're taking the waste bread, people like you guys don't need to worry about it. It is a problem, but, but it isn't... It's a heck of a lot better than it used to be because society is so much more aware of waste in general, of which food waste is part of it. Why not just make less bread so there's less surplus? But we don't... We, you know, we, we're responding to orders. We don't... By making less bread doesn't solve the problem. You know, then we get criticised, well, the trouble is we ordered a 1,000 loads off Warburton's and they only made 900. So, funnily enough, they'll go and get the 100 from somebody else. Well, I'm not going to let that happen. Why not just sit down with Mr Kingsmill and Mr Hovis and Mr Morrison's and Mr Asda and say, let's all make a little bit less? Um, I think that's probably a lovely idea, but highly unlikely. Bread waste is an industry-wide problem. But I think until consumers, supermarkets and all the major bread companies start coming together to help solve this issue, it's clearly not going away anytime soon. Warburton's rise from a regional bakery brand to Britain's number one grocery brand has been helped by the success of one of their best loved products. Crumpets. For me, the simple hot buttered crumpet, perfect any time of day. <laughs> I have now discovered the giant crumpet, which is the size of my face. I mean, can you get better than that? In Warburton's Bolton Bakery, they make up to 10,000 crumpets an hour and the company sells around 700 million individual crumpets a year. Crumpets have been a quintessential British tea time treat since the 17th century, usually made from a batter consisting of flour, water, yeast and salt. They're popular in Australia, New Zealand and Canada, but Britain is the world's crumpet capital. We get through over 162 million packets of them a year. That must never get boring. I work in crumpets. No, it doesn't. Um, I've worked with Crumpets now for seven years and it, it's a great product to work with. So all the ingredients all fed into our mixes and then we ferment the batter. So that's a trick. It releases some gas and then when the batter then goes onto the hot plate, that gas then rises up and then creates bubbles. I can see the bubbles literally popping. That's yeah, absolutely. And that's what creates the holes. That is the holes forming on the Crumpet right in front of your eyes but when they come off the end, you start to see the, the crumpet characteristic. Ah! So it just finishes off that baking process with a grill, and then they come, flip off into the cooler. Why did you start making giant crumpets? Because it tastes twice as good. <laughs> she got literally got told to say that. I did. <laughs> Warburton's crumpet recipe is regularly assessed by the quality team who test the products as they roll off the line. Hi, how are you? You must be Kirsten. I am, yes. Hi, Helen. Do you want to follow me upstairs? Yes, please. So this is where the magic happens. It is absolutely, yes. To ensure the company's standards of quality are met, 
They're food scientists forensically test everything, from slicing profiles to crumb texture to dull elasticity. Today, quality manager Kirsten will be analysing a sample packet of crumpets. This is our finished product assessment laboratory on this side of the room, and we also have a raw materials and flower testing laboratory on that side of the room. This is a lot more high-tech than I thought it was going to be. It is, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. So, crumpets. What will you do to them? If I pass the crumpets to Michael. Thank you. He's going to put one of the crumpets into the image analysis machine, work a bit of magic on the keyboard, and then it'll do its analysis, and we'll get a result that will tell us how many holes are in that crumpet. Why do you need to know how many holes are in the crumpet? Because that's the, the, the key to perfection with crumpets. If you get the right number of holes in the crumpet, then you get the fluffiness, the bite, the taste of the crumpet that you expect. It's all about the number, actually, that's the really key. And what measure. is the perfect number? We would have between 250, 300 uh, holes. We call them flutes because it's like a, a little sort of chimney, because it goes from the bottom of the crumpet to the top. But, but that's the number that, that is, is really good. More than that, and we're really starting to push those boundaries and excelling. 250? 250 to 300. If you're below 250, then you're starting to see, you know, insufficient holes, and that's when you get this issue around the eating characteristics. Feels a bit heavy. Feels a bit heavy, yes. You can't say, but I can, like some of your competitors, feel a bit heavy, not enough holes. You said that. And how many's in that crumpet? So, if I flick over to my so crumpet analyzer, that is now going to give us a figure for porosity. So, as you can see, number of pores, that's 311, so 311 <gasps> pores. Oh, so this is the perfect crumpet? It's the perfect crumpet, just what we wanted. So, when you get 311, are you all a bit like, yes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I love the detail that goes into this. It must be fun, though. And none of my friends understand what I actually do. So they might find out now, maybe, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> they're always they questioning it. Um, I think they think I'm in the bakery, just kind of sweeping or something at the side, so they, they might have a bit more insight now. Warburton's obsessive attention to detail means Stephen and Emma need to check the vital statistics of this batch of tea cakes. I don't want to underestimate anything you're doing, but this is what my child does with a fruity <laughs> tea cake. What are you gleaning from this? So we're looking at um, distribution of the fruit without the tea cake because in a mix, fruit's been thrown about with inside the dough. And also some of it does get broken down as well, but we're also looking at the amount of fruit per the amount of uh, whole tea cake. Um, so on the back of the pack, for example, we look at 13% total fruit. And the feedback from this batch is, so far, good or bad? We're looking pretty good so far. That's a perfect, yeah. Mm. I mean, you've ruined that tea cake, guys. <laughs> <laughs> the team's pursuit of perfection involves analysing their products with state-of-the-art technology. What's actually happening? Well, what we've got here is a laser that scans the loaf and it takes measurements of the entire loaf so that we can see a 3D image that comes on the screen. I literally thought you looked at a loaf of bread and you kind of gave it a bit of a squeeze and you're like, yeah, it's good to go. Oh, we, we do a bit of that as well. But the data that we collect in here will tell us if we're producing great quality products. What are you seeing, Michael? That's our, like, density, our volume, our surface area, our height, our width. So we get a huge amount of data from that scan. Can you tell from numbers if bread tastes good? Some of the numbers you can, absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, there's... It's really hard to replace the when you're looking at flavour and aroma, the taste test, of course, yeah. But with a combination of the test, we can then form a picture and you know it's got the attributes that means when a consumer bites into it, they're going to get a great tasting experience. The quality team has never been busier with the huge variety of goods now on offer. With so much choice, our tastes are changing and sales of the white sliced loaf have been declining in recent years. In the 1970s, it accounted for 50% of Warburton's sales. But this figure has now slumped to 25%. It seems the palates of some British consumers are changing. What I don't understand is why so many people are happy to just eat bread like this. This doughy, flaccid stuff. I love tiger bread and I really, really love sourdough rosemary sea salt bread. This is real bread. 
I love sourdough. Yeah, I made you some. Try. Have a good bite and tell me what you think. of sourdough bread have risen by 40% in the last five years. Its distinctive taste and texture is derived from the fermentation process that makes it rise. A regular loaf can be made in four hours using a fast-acting yeast. Whereas sourdough rises over the course of several days using a natural yeast grown in flour and water. Although sourdough is traditionally produced by smaller bakeries, Warburton's is always looking to future-proof their empire by diversifying their range of products. They've recently invested a million pounds in setting up a trial bakery in Milton Keynes. I want to find out what makes sourdough unique, so innovation technical controller Peter has agreed to show me Warburton's approach to making this artisan product. Here, the sourdough mix is machine-made, with the final stage hand-rolled. So we started to look at this process around about two years ago. Right. The technical challenge for this particular project was about producing consistent-looking products, but with still all of the, the characteristics that you would associate with an artisan loaf of bread. If you are doing bits of it by hand, that's more expensive and more time-consuming, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. Tip the sourdough into the bay in the centre, because of the long ferment involved in terms of making the sourdough, this is around about four days from start to finish. So if you take your scraper, we're just going to just start to bring the flour in from the inside edge of the bay. <gasps> oh, we've had a leak. The dam's leaked. Just keep, keep, keep bringing the flour in. <laughs> just use your scraper. <laughs> <laughs> as, you, as you work and develop the dough, stretch and, and pull those proteins in there, you'll find that the water it gets less sticky. OK. What we don't want to do is have a product which is inconsistent on a daily basis. Come on! Surely the whole point of it being artisan is that it's unique and different well, and one-off and all. We say, well, you know, if, if the consumer wants to make a, a, a sandwich and the slice profile of, of something on, on a Wednesday is very different to the slice profile shape on, on a Monday, it, you know, from a usability point of view, you could argue that, you know, that becomes a problem. It's interesting because obviously there's been quite a trendy backlash against the Starbucks and the Costas of the world because there's a lot of people who think, oh no, they've done a terrible thing to coffee and we should all go to our local independent coffee shop. Some purists might say you're doing the same to the artisan baker. I don't think they should be worried um, because I think you know each of the bakeries regionally will, will have their own sort of niche. What we're looking to do is to democratise that particular product offering. By democratise, Peter means producing artisan sourdough on an industrial scale and selling it in supermarkets and grocery stores across Britain. With this in mind, I want to find out how Warburton sourdough compares to a loaf made by a local independent baker. I've come to Ingleton, North Yorkshire, to meet Dan, whose award-winning bread has earned him the title The Sourdough King. Hello! Oh my days, look at this sourdough heaven! <laughs> it's just loads of it going through today. I just can't get over the explosion in how popular it's become. Because just... of social media. Did it? Yeah. Oh, so there's been this massive bread revolution, uh, inspired by like the Real Bread campaign, uh, independent bakeries like myself, where we've put on this massive social media about how bread's actually made. We have big buckets of sourdough starter that we feed every day. It's a living organism. It's a natural yeast. That, it's still you know, an art to making sourdough. Yeah, yeah. It's all down to love, patience, and time, and that's it. How do you feel about Warburton's in general? Because their business model and what they do is like the opposite to what you do. You're here crafting everything by hand, yeah. and it is proper artisan. Yes. They're moving into the artisan market. Is sort of the artisan market. They they're making a product to mimic our product. They're making a loaf of bread on a commercial scale, so every single one's the same. And they'll make one, but it won't be like ours. Right. They'll make it... Does it taste as good? Um, it'll, it'll taste like a loaf of bread. It won't taste like one of mine, no. You've won awards yeah. for your sourdough. You're the king of sourdough. You could say, it won't taste as good as mine, but I feel like you're too humble for that. You're saying, 
it won't be the same as mine. How will it be different? Um, it won't have had the three or four days of love that mine's had. We're making it of a craft sort of way. People definitely want quality over quantity at the minute. I'm quite happy doing what we do and doing it well, whereas a commercial way, they're just literally after one thing, and that's the bottom line. That's the money aspect. The Warburton sourdough is still at the trial stage. <laughs> Thank you so much. But is expected to be a bit cheaper than Dan's artisan loaf. I'm keen to see how they compare. I've got two sourdough loaves. One is from the Sourdough King, one is from Warburton's. They look very different. In my mind, when you say it's artisan, to me, it's quirky, it's crafty, it's got a few imperfections which show that it's been crafted by hand, and I think that definitely does. The Warburton's one looks a lot neater. Right, I'm going to rip a bit off this and try it. So. I mean, this is what I need now is butter and a glass of wine. Actually, you don't need anything. Even the crust of that is really nice. Now for the Warburtons. <laughs> Not as easy to get into. <laughs> Look at it, I mean, it looks the biz. Actually, it's very soft in the middle and tasty. I really like everybody at Warburton's, but that's way better. If Warburton's want to make the best sourdough on the market that is the most artisan product, then no, I don't think they have done it. I don't think that's what they're trying to do. I think for them, it's about bringing another product to the market. Can it compete with the artisan sourdough makers? For some people, yeah, but not for everyone. Warburton's built their 146-year-old baking business on the traditional white slice loaf. But tastes are changing, and it's no longer the surefire money spinner it once was. An extensive range of craft breads and other wrapped bakery products have shaken up the market, and company boss Jonathan Warburton has to constantly diversify to stay on trend. So far, I've looked at Warburton's trial run of a sourdough loaf, But now the innovation team have set their sights on another slice of the multi-billion pound baking industry. Luxury cakes. Hello. Morning. These gorgeous looking products, cakes. Yep. Warburton's, discuss. Well, Warburton's is known as baking. And um, we decided that uh, if you go and talk to consumers and said, look, we'd like to go into breakfast cereals, they're like, why would you want to do that? Be your, your bakers and you make bread. But if you go, well, we'd like to go cakes, they go, yeah, it makes perfect sense. So it's a, it's a sidestep, but it's not a total tangent. No, exactly. And in a way, what we're trying to do is use the sort of reassurance that Warburton's is a quality brand that we know and trust. But this is a new part of that business as it's looking to develop in the, in the future, and it's incredibly early days because they're only available in a couple of shops at the moment, but it's to test the water and see how consumers react. The innovation team have come up with an eight-strong cake collection named after Jonathan's great-great-aunt Ellen Warburton, one of the founders of the company. Where are you testing them? Uh, there's, well, there's a pop-up shop in Harrogate and there's one in Skipton. I mean, people in Harrogate have got money. You know, this is How much is a Do you buy it in a box? If you bought a box of four, that's a tenner. Okay. At the moment, they're three quid each. And it's an unashamed mass market offering, but it's at the higher end price wise compared with what is in the market at the moment. Mm -hmm. The cakes shouldn't be really cheap. They, they should be a treat. They should be a really good quality treat. Who are you aiming these at? It's not obviously Warburton's, no. but talk me through the, the colouring and stuff. Well, I look, I'm, I'll nick anybody's idea. I'm not the slightest bit proud. If you look at one or two brands that have got a quality positioning, uh, but in a fairly mass market way, that colour's quite prevalent. But I could see this in Selfridges. Yeah, and one of my colleagues who's worked with us on this project was very involved with the original rebranding of Selfridges. Right. And when we talked about this colour, he immediately referenced it and said, 
that was the colour that Selfridges ended up. And an average Selfridge consumer would be somebody we would target as an average Nelly's cake consumer. Warburton's plan to move up market with luxury cakes. So I want to see how the trial is going at the pop-up shop in Skipton, North Yorkshire. Narrow little street for him to get down <laughs> there, isn't it? It is. Good challenge. Yeah. Project lead Debbie is overseeing the trial. So how often are you getting cakes delivered to the shop? So we're getting cakes uh, delivered four times a week. OK. <laughs> right, well, I may as well make myself useful. Should I take these? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, if the new right. cakes are a hit with the public, they'll be rolled out across the UK. I tell you what, it's nice to see them all out on display, cos I, I saw the little box, I thought, oh, they're nice, but this is impressive. Yeah. Also, we have the, the tasting area where you can come and try them. You can just help yourself, right? You can. So... You can. So what is this, Debbie? Is this a come and buy cake or is it a market research, come and try and tell us what you think? It's a bit of both, really. It's really important to us that we find out what people like and what people don't like and that we start to build our knowledge on cake. And will you use the information gathered in this shop to change the recipe, amend the products and things like that? Yes. Yep. Oh, wow. So we're, we're learning, we are recording, we have questionnaires that people fill in, uh, the staff in the shop record comments that people say. Why is there a bowl of ping pong balls on the table? So that's part of us collecting data. So we ask customers to basically take a ping pong ball and put them into this cabinet here of their favourite products. And it's quite fun as well. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to try another bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Okay. Ah, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great. Do you guys eat a lot of the cake? Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say no, but yeah. This is a really good test of whether or not people like these cakes and whether or not people are going to buy these cakes. And there's no doubt they're getting useful information. Bread's on the decline, they've got to do something else. If they want to stay this huge, massive, successful family business, they've got to step into something else. As well as being available in two pop-up shops, Ellie's cakes can now be ordered online. I thought I'd get some in and invite my mum round to help me do a bit of market research at home. I ordered some of the Warburton's luxury cakes online to see what the service is like. It did get delivered. I think it's a really good idea. I think if I got this through the post, I'd be very excited. So this is the kind of thing you could have as a treat. Can I open it? Oh, yes, please. What are you going for? Possibly the chocolate one. But do they get Granny Skelton's approval? Mm. Beautiful. I think this is a good one. Definitely. I don't want the rest. You know, like if you go to your friend's house for a coffee? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the kids are all kicking off, I would take something like that as an apology for the mess. <laughs> really they just nice. look nice, don't they? Yeah, really nice. Perhaps these luxury cakes are a small glimpse of Warburton's future. So before I leave, I want to ask Jonathan what he thinks the company will look like in years to come. How likely is it then that the future or the next 100 years of Warburton's will be you guys moving into cakes and artisan products? I think it will be a combination of that, plus a combination of us looking to reinvent sliced bread as we know it today. I mean, bread consumption has been in decline for as long as I can remember. It's 1% a year, but on the amount of volume of bread sold daily, 1%'s a lot. Does that worry you? Uh, of course it does. And one of the reasons why we're doing sourdough, why we're bagels, why we sell so many crumpets, why we're now looking at the cakes, is because you, you there's no point it would worry me, but it's a pointless waste of time worrying about it. What you've got to do is fix it. Whenever the day comes that you retire, which I think will be a long way off, <laughs> you must be pretty happy thinking, job done. No. I, yeah, you're right at one level, but no. You can't, let, you can't have that state of mind, I don't think. You know, we have had a bloody good run of things. We have done OK. We have spent a significant amount of shareholder money building this. But if people are going to come and work in this environment, the thick end of 5,000 people, they need to know 
that the owners are never going to be satisfied and will always want to keep pushing the business to the next level because you are either going forwards or backwards. You are never stationary because if you stop, the market moves around you. I think the honesty of Jonathan Warburton is so disarming. This is a business and it's a successful business that employs thousands of people. It's a brand that is in everybody's homes that's, that's seeing market growth in a time when people are turning their back on bread. I mean, that's a massive success in itself, isn't it? Maybe I'm impressed by the ambition and the energy. You know, he's been doing this for 40 years. He is running a business that has faced unprecedented challenges. He's got to deal with surplus. He's got to deal with so many things, yet his excitement and drive is unfaltering. Whoever takes on the business next undoubtedly has big challenges and big shoes to fill. It would just be interesting to see whether Jonathan really does take that step back. I don't think he'll ever take his foot off the gas. He can wait. <laughs>